Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Shanka Show. Stories about life in the Soviet Union. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи! В эфире программа Ушанка Show. Today's video is a part two of my review of Black on Red, My 44 Years Inside the Soviet Union by Robert Robinson. But before we begin, for those who already watched the part one, I just want to quickly trace uh, Robert's uh, journey from United States to Soviet Russia. He left New York City on a Soviet ship and arrived to Leningrad. From Leningrad, him and other American specialists hired to work at Soviet factories. They traveled by train to Moscow, stayed there for several days, then they took another train to Gorky, which is called again Nizhny Novgorod. And from Gorky, they traveled on a boat down to the Volga River all the way to Stalingrad. Now it's called Volgograd. And now back to the book, Black and Red. If you remember, uh, we stopped at the moment when uh, Robert Robertson decided to become a Soviet citizen. He had a hard choice. Uh, in order to maintain his American citizenship, he was required to quit and go back to the United States. And he decided to stay and became Soviet citizen. So this is, we're talking 1933. So in the beginning of chapter 10, Robert Robinson is talking about social engineering and the second purge. So here he'll be actually explaining uh, the reasons behind the purges that started going through the Soviet society. I had made my faithful decision, he's talking about becoming a Soviet citizen, at a time when disappearances were increasing but could not yet be considered epidemic. That soon changed. The massive government scheme to reorder society, which had begun in 1933, was picking up steam. And that's exactly what was going on back in the 30s. People literally disappeared from life. Today he was at work, tomorrow a person didn't show up, because last night at 3 a.m. Encavader showed up at his doors, he got arrested, no warning, nothing, and he is in prison, and then even his family doesn't know what happened. And then person just gone. Uh, so this is how the American engineers saw it. By the spring of 1936, almost all of the young people trained as engineers and in technical fields during the years of 1927 to 1932 had disappeared. The authorities first created an entire class of technocrats and then destroyed it because they came to view this class as a threat to their power. Before they could eliminate these skilled industrial leaders, the party and government prepared their replacement so that the country's industrial progress would not come to a grinding halt. And if you studied Soviet Union under Stalin, that's pretty much was his pattern. Once in a while, every five years or so, he will, like a lawnmower or almost like a tiller, he will go through society, remove the old growth and replace it with new hungry people so i guess that was his way of keeping the blood fresh and flowing another quick side note so robinson signed a one-year contract and when it was about to expire he worked that first year at stalingrad tractor plant uh, he went to moscow and he decided to renew his contract since he was making really good money and he enjoyed his work and while he was renewing his contract he got offered to work in Moscow at the local uh, bearing factory. So he ended up moving from Stalingrad to Moscow, capital of the Soviet Union. All right, so now we reached a really interesting part. It's a Hitler-Stalin pact. And it's interesting, everywhere they call it Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, but Robert Robertson called it like it was. It was an agreement between Hitler and Stalin. So that's what he says. It says the Hitler-Stalin pact. Soon after Yezhov's fall from power in the summer of 1939, the Kremlin announced that it had signed a pact with Nazi Germany. If you uh, study history of the Soviet Union, uh, Stalin cycled through several NKVD leaders. He had Yagoda, who became a traitor, got shot. Yagoda was replaced with Yezhov, who became a traitor, got shot. And Yezhov was replaced with Lavrin Tiberia, who ended up being a... Uh, NKVD leader all the way till the death of Stalin and of course uh, things didn't work out between him and Nikita Khrushchev and uh, Beria also got 
um, executed. All right, back to the book. So the Kremlin announced that it had signed a pact with Nazi Germany. Everyone in my shop was shocked and amazed. It was more than perplexing to the Russians. It hurt to think that their country, which championed equality, fraternity, and world peace, had overnight become linked to Adolf Hitler. This was as incongruous to the Russians as an alliance between KKK and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People would have been to Americans. <laughs> That's a great comparison. In my shop, some workers wept openly while others were solemn. So this situation when the government makes literally 180 turn in relations with other countries and confusing their own citizens reminded me of the book of 1984. Like there's a country of Oceania or something, I barely remember. It was an enemy, suddenly became a friend, all the newspapers were changed. So here's a classic example that Robinson explains how people were confused, like, wait a minute, yesterday we were thought Nazis were the scam of the world, and today newspapers tell us they actually, without explaining why, they assured the newspapers, readers, that the treaty with Germany would be in the best interest of the people. But what really shocked me is the following. In fact, an immediate result of the pact was increased hardship for the average Russian, because foods like meat, sugar, eggs, butter, and flour were now being shipped to Germany. This was difficult for people to take, especially considering that these foods had become available at the general food stores only recently after years of severe rationing. I even heard party members grumbling about sending the food off to Nazis. We never learned what or anything Russia received from Germany other than two years of peace. I mean, I knew that the uh, Soviet Union was shipped large quantities of grain and foodstuff and oil to Nazi Germany under this agreement about friendship and borders, but that it instantly affected average Soviet citizen with the sh shells becoming empty again. This is uh, amazing. And think about it, in the regular country, Remember, like, several years ago, Macron in France tried to raise fuel tax and the whole country, like, exploded. Was that yellow jackets or something movement? Here, food disappeared because Soviet government decided to be friends with Nazi Germany and people just quietly grumbling. This is the dictatorship of proletariat for you. So, yeah, that's the stuff you can't learn in history books. This is, like, best thing ever. Witness accounts of those days, especially... From the American point of view, I, I find it just amazing. And it's getting even better. Because he says uh, a little bit down the same page. After the treaty was signed, the message and emphasis of Soviet internal propaganda changed significantly. Ever since my arrival in 1930, the press and radio had trumpeted the need of worldwide expansion of communism and that every Russian should work toward that end. The caption beneath every newspaper and magazine logos read, Workers of the World Unite. Proletariat всех стран соединяйтесь. And right after this agreement with Nazi Germany, nationalism was the new emphasis. Huge banners hung in every shop in the factory that read, Love your country first and always. Large signs were posted at railroad stations. Along the railroad tracks, colored flowers were arranged to spell out the new slogans. Russians were now implored, Love your mighty motherland always. Всегда люби родину мать. The spirit of internationalism had departed. Because I obviously was not Russian, this had a direct effect on my well-being. People who had once been friendly now kept their distance. Strangers no longer greet me warmly on the street, and now I was often treated with disdain. So once again, it, it's just amazing. And in my opinion, uh, Stalin uh, really underestimated Soviet people. I think he thought that he kind of got to the level that people almost like robots. If you tell them, 
you know, new command, they just do it without thinking, without their own opinion. But it's hard for people to process, especially if you uh, have some critical thinking. I mean, picture if Fox News overnight will start just saying that Biden is the best uh, president ever and uh, Trump was the worst president ever. There'll be a lot of people very, very confused and angry. This is what pretty much Stalin was doing. You know, yesterday we were for international expansion of communism and today Nazi Germany, our best friend, and all we care about is our national pride. I mean, that's a huge pillow to swallow and I don't think, you know, Soviet people could pr handle it really well. I mean, which I'm not surprised. And this next chapter actually reminded me of modern Russia because it said, those of us living inside Russia were never told the particulars of the alliance with Germany, but Soviet military actions to some extent soon made it clear. So remember, there was a secret pact uh, besides the official agreement uh, between uh, Germany and Soviet Union about uh, splitting uh, zones of interest. So in 1939 and 1940, Russian troops uh, seized Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, part of Poland, and Bessarabia and Chernovtsi in Romania, without resistance from the Germans. Each mighty giant would gobble up defenseless nations knowing that the other one do was doing the same. And here we go. The Russian people were very proud. One evening at the cinema, newsreels were shown of Russian troops and armored vehicles blazing across Bessarabia. The entire audience rose clapping and cheering, shouting bravo while shaking their fists defiantly in the air. They were so callously proud of how their nation was overrunning defenseless people. I was astonished. So once again, think about 2014 and Russia uh, occupying Crimea and all the Russian people are so thrilled and happy that we returned what belongs to us. You know, we've seen this movie over and over again, not only in Russia, but this is this is just priceless. And remember recently I just uh, made a video about secret helpers in the Winter War of 1939 that uh, Swedish uh, professor managed to crack Soviet military codes and was helping uh, Finns to learn about uh, Red Army plans. So let's see what Robert Robertson said about it. So this is the way communism is going to establish peace and social justice in the world, I thought. I had been just as surprised at the Russian people's reaction after Soviet radio announced on December 10, 1939, that Finland had provoked peace, love in Russia into a war. They felt indignant toward Finland ignoring the obvious differences in the size of relative strength of the two nations. No one ever suggested that the Soviets, not the Finns, might be the aggressors. And a quick side note, because some people didn't catch my sarcasm in the video about Winter of 1939, when I said, according to the Soviet historians, it was Finland that attacked Soviet Union first. I got quite a few angry comments. But I am not a Soviet historian. According to the Soviet historians, that's what happened. But for me, it's obvious that it was not Finland who uh, started the war. On page 141, I found an interesting short note. So, you know, Soviet Union hired thousands of foreign specialists to come and work in the Soviet Union. Uh, so here, uh, what he says, by mid-July 1941, the number of foreigners working in my factory had been reduced drastically. When I began in 1932, there were 362 of us. Now a Hungarian and I were the only ones left. So from 362 workers at a single factory in Moscow in 1932, nine years later, only two remained. The other ones left back, went home or they disappeared. Another part that caught my attention, this is already 1941, the war is going on, and there's one uh, co-worker of 
Comrade Robinson approached him and said, I have something important I must tell you. I've chosen you to share what's in my heart because I trust you. At first we had lots of confidence in our party and government. We were promised that in 15 years we would forge ahead of America. So that's before Nikita Khrushchev promise. This is Stalin's pr uh, promise. What's more, we were promised that no wars would be fought on Russian soil. We believed those promises with all our heart and soul. But now we know that our leaders have run away to safer places and have left us leaderless. Today Moscow has been abandoned and the great mass of people have been left to face the murderous Germans. So here he's talking, uh, sounds like it's in November of 1941 when Moscow was like inches uh, away from being uh, taken over by the Germans. He paused here, again searching my eyes, then added, Please, Comrade Robinson, if you should be fortunate enough to be able to reach the West, please tell your people there the whole truth about the Soviet system, that the Russian people have been grossly deceived, that there had never been such a betrayal in history. Let the world know how we have suffered and we are deprived of the good things in life, thinking always that the policies of Lenin were being carried out. Now we see that everything promised us was a fraud. Since 1917 we have been asked to sacrifice for the better day that was sure to come. Now we know that our leaders fooled us into the pact with the Nazis that has become our gravestone. After so much sweat and toil, going without meat for months at a time, sometimes going to bed on an empty stomach, hoping that everything we have done would make life happier for the people, nothing has come true. I really have like nothing to add to this speech, except, you know, I see a lot of similarity with religion, because in religion it's also leaders of church uh, tell you to suffer, and sacrifice because in your afterlife they're going to be paradise and this is the benefit of religion there is no way people who died can send the message like hey dude there's nothing there just empty parking lot here people have some kind of time frame okay we will suffer for 15 years for a better future for us and our children and then 15 years later they see that nothing happened so religion in that uh, respect has better advantage because they tell you it's afterlife when it's going to be paradise. Well, uh, communists had to promise in nearby future and it didn't work. Okay, my friends, so we're going to stop right here. Uh, we're on the page 160, so we're about through the half of the book. So it sounds like we're probably going to have another two videos to cover the whole thing. If you have any questions, please post in comments below this video. And we'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye. By the way, the cool merch for cool comrades is available at the Ushanka store at the teespring.com. Just a friendly reminder that my book American Diaries is available on Amazon.com or shoot me an email if you would like to have a signed copy. Thank you! And if you love my channel and would like to show your support, please click on the link below this video and become the patron of the Ushanka show. For as little as one dollar you can help us grow and create the new interesting videos about the life in Soviet 